hope everybody is having a great uh, start to their weekend. Uh, for those of you who will be celebrating Christmas in whatever way, Kwanzaa coming up and all of that, I wish you the best um, to each and every one their own. Uh, but definitely as we prepare to transition from one uh, year to the next, uh, do it in love, do it with a positive mindset, do it with a high expectation and anticipation of what's to come. Be prepared to commit uh, to being the best version of yourself because it is you at your height that will contribute to the change uh, that is so desperately needed across the uh, globe. Um, change doesn't come by wishing and hoping. Change comes by actively participating in the dynamic of said change. And so that's something that we have to be uh, cognizant of at all times. Look, I've got uh, two, uh, two topics along the same line to talk to you about. I'm going to do this as quickly as possible. Uh, the first being um, Jason Whitlock's uh, statement uh, after Kim Potter, uh, the person who killed Dun uh, Dante Wright after a traffic stop, the ex-cop who killed uh, Dante Wright after a traffic stop, uh, the statement he made and why that statement is problematic um, while being um, true to a certain extent, why it's problematic and why it's not shocking uh, coming from Jason Whitlock. The second will be uh, a, 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 com a, quick a quick monologue on Lauren Smith Fields, a young 23-year-old uh, black uh, young lady who uh, was found dead or unresponsive in her apartment in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, high school track uh, star in school for cosmetology, doing some work, <clears throat> had sort of built herself up uh, a following on YouTube, uh, but met an older white guy on Bumble. And it was this white guy who actually alerted police to the fact that she was dead. Based on the stories uh, that I have been gotten up, I'm going to touch on both of these because there are some things that stick out to me that I want to touch on and talk about that are, to me, problematic in our approach to black death. Uh, first and foremost, let's get to... Uh, the story of Dante Wright and him being killed by Kim Potter. For those who don't know the story, here's the quick gist of it. Dante was pulled over because of supposedly an expired license plate and um, air freshener hanging from his rearview mirror. For those of us in the South in Texas, uh, that's completely mind-blowing, but there are literally states where laws don't allow anything to hang um, between the vision and the windshield of the driver, so you can't hang anything from your rearview mirror. Uh, it's considered an obstruction, an illegal obstruction, and you can be pulled over and ticketed for it. Uh, so what seems trivial uh, to many of us is something that people in other states are aware of, and choose to or not to abide by. Uh, but we have to be clear that what initiated the stop were two minor traffic violations. Uh, after pulling him over and running uh, a check on the license, on his driver's license, uh, it was determined that he had an open warrant for a failure to appear on a misdemeanor uh, weapons possession charge. In other words, in most states uh, that don't allow open carry uh, in any form or um, unlicensed possession, uh, you can simply be riding around with a weapon in your vehicle. And if you're pulled over a stop and it's determined it's in there, you can be charged with a misdemeanor of unlawful possession of a firearm. And it's a misdemeanor, but you can be charged with it. So that was an open warrant for that because he didn't show up to court for it. So 
they went back to uh, take him into custody, ask him to step out of the car, which he did, to get down on the ground, which he did. And when they went to cuff him, he jumped back up in the car to drive off. And one of our officers uh, is wrestling with him. Uh, Kim Potter says that she meant to pull her taser and pull her service weapon um, by mistake and screamed, taser, 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 which is required to let any officers who may be in contact with the individual clear so that they don't get shocked or tasered. And she did, she did that and she fired. Now, at the time she did this, the other officer was still engaged. Um, but all the testimony points to the fact that there were way too many protocols that weren't followed, um, that she was found guilty on two counts. In the, uh, she was on two counts, voluntary manslaughter and manslaughter. Voluntary manslaughter requires a higher level of proof uh, manslaughter is simply the negligence in a sense that you did something that could have led to, that you could reasonably expect could lead to the death of an individual. Um, the first one is you have to do, you have to uh, fulfill the charge of manslaughter, which is doing something negligent that could uh, reasonably be expected to lead to the death of an individual. Voluntary manslaughter meant you do it while you did it while in the commission of another crime. And they proved vote both to a jury. The jury found Kim Potter guilty, I believe, on yesterday. She was remanded uh, without bail uh, bond until her sentencing in February, despite all kinds of antics by her attorney uh, to get her released. You know, she's a Catholic and it's Christmas and all these other things. But I'm here to talk about Jason Whitlock, who... Um, thought it was a good idea to come on and uh, basically say he agrees with the, the guilty verdict uh, because what she did was wrong. But he, it needs to be said that Dante Wright put himself in harm's way by resisting. What's scary about that is that it's true. It's true in the sense that he did put himself in harm's way because he was resisting police officers after they discovered that he had an open warrant for a weapon. It's one of the first things that went through my mind, but it was something that I would never say while the case was still being tried. I can say it now because she's been found guilty, and obviously they knew all of this uh, during the trial, and they still found her guilty, which speaks volumes. Uh, but it wouldn't be something I would say in the context of her guilty verdict. That would be by me spoken um, in, in very small groups in private, and I'm saying it now because he said it, and I'm going to tell you why it's dangerous. Because... When it's spoken, and it's spoken by a black person with a platform, you start, again, giving people uh, the idea that killing someone because they resist is justification. What really bothers me as a person who hangs his hat in the, uh, in the area and the spectrum of human behavior, understand that while police officers have been trained or should have been trained extensively, she was obviously, according to her supervisors, trained well enough to be training an officer on the date that this happened. So she should be experienced enough to, first of all, understand protocols and also to be able to operate in high intense, highly vol volatile situations and still understanding the rules of engagement. We send young 18-year-old kids over in war um war situations with the rules of engagement. They know what those rules of engagement are. They cannot fire unless they're fired upon, no matter how threatening the situation may be. And there are other rules of engagement, and they are schooled on them, and they're expected to abide by them. If they don't abide by them, they will be court-martialed. And so now you have police officers which are professionals, and they're out doing their job. The person you are arresting is not a professional or an expert in dealing with volatile, anxious-written uh, situations. 
how a person responds psychologically, emotionally, and physically to stress is going to be different. And it is um, unreasonable to expect an untrained individual to deal with a stressful situation in the same way. You don't know what was going through his head. This isn't me making an excuse for his behavior. This is me saying that you have to be aware of it. So if you're aware of it, you got to understand that he don't know what was going through his mind. Is he in fear for his life? Does he trust the system enough to say, I'm going to let you cuff me? Uh, is it something that was said that no one knows about that made him feel like, nah, I better get my ass out of here? We don't know that. At least I don't know that. But whatever happened was, at the time, there was no gun visible. Matter of fact, there was no gun present that he could have gotten to in the car. So it was never a fear of the gun. Now, she said she feared the fact that he was going to drive off and drag her partner. And here's the real problem. Should he have jumped up and tried to run? Legally, no. Growing up in the hood, you never know what's going to happen. You got a chance to get away. Hey. Um, so you've got those two things. You've got the legal side of things. Legal side of things says uh, go ahead, submit to the arrest, and uh, fight your case in court. Unfortunately, that doesn't always turn out well for black men. Uh, we're looking at daily black men being released after serving decades for crimes they did not do. So you can say that there is a legitimate reason for distrust in the system and distrust in the process at a level that, no, I'm not going in there because I don't think I'm going to get a fair shake. Again, this is not me justifying it. This is me mm -hmm. saying that it's never as simple as you want to make it. Also, when it comes down to human behavior, let's be real. Uh, high stress situations. Number one is, people are talking about, well, he should have just went to the ground. Your natural response when someone is trying to take you down is to maintain your footing. Your, 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 your natural instinct, if somebody's trying to forcefully take you down, is that if I totally give in to this, they might just let me hit the ground hard. So you are going to naturally resist. It is, try to get somebody to say, okay, I'm going to take you down. And let them take you down in a way where you sense that they're going to take you down hard. You're going to automatically resist. It's a stress. I mean, it's an instinctive response. It's a physiological instinctive response that has nothing to do with whether I'm going to comply or not. It's just simply that when someone's trying to move you in a way that you can't trust the way they're moving you, you're going to resist to try to maintain your balance so that you can protect yourself. That's just natural. Also, when you are in a stressful situation, what we would now, what, what most people call fight or flight, it's a stress response to a fearful situation. And the prefrontal cortex shuts down because it uses 30% of your blood flow, 30% of the oxygen in the body at any given time is in the prefrontal cortex when you are conscious. That's where your uh, impulse control is. That's where your uh, reasoning is. That's where your decision making is. All of that is in the prefrontal cortex. And so when that you go into fight or flight, that shuts down. So making good decisions in that situation aren't highly likely. So you are highly on an instinctive survival mode. And the chances of you making logical, good logical choices aren't high. You're going to do what you think you need to do to get away from something. So with that being said, with that being said, it is immensely important to understand how we talk about things like that. You know, should they have done this? Should they have done this? The bottom line is it's the officer's responsibility to act within the guidelines and the protocols of what's required in order to use deadly force. Now, what's important in understanding this is she admits she never meant to use deadly force. So you can't use the protocol for deadly force in it. I wasn't intending on using deadly force. I, I am saying I felt that there was a need for to, uh, 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 to tase this person in order to bring them into compliance, but definitely not deadly force. Well, then you can't make any arguments about whether deadly force was necessary because I wasn't intending on using it. So then what were you doing? You were saying that you couldn't tell the difference between your taser and your gun. 
Uh, as a person that's handled guns for a long time and have held tasers of all different types, it's no way you confuse that. Number one is the weight is completely different. Anybody that will tell you that's handled firearms extensively, they can tell you, they can pick up their weapon that they've used multiple times and handled multiple times and tell you uh, not only that it's their weapon, it's a completely different feel. You know the handle of your weapon. I, I know the handle of each weapon. Uh, it feels different. I can, t without, with our eyes open, can touch the handle and tell you which one of the weapons it is. And I'm talking about the weapons alone, not not just the taser, the weapons. I can tell you that. Okay. Not only can I do that, but I can also tell you whether the clip is full, close to being half empty, or close to being empty or empty, just by holding it. Now, there's an entirely different feel for the taser completely it's a handle it's kind of held like a gun but it's nowhere near uh, a firearm it's not the weight is not even close number two it's a different color and the biggest thing is that people don't get who have who, people who have either never fired a firearm or not done it enough in order to fire a weapon at someone you've got to aim it at them which puts the weapon in your line of sight you see it before you shoot the one thing you see in order to take aim is the weapon. So the idea that she didn't know, nah. Uh, to me, it should have been way more than manslaughter, but hey, it is what it is. But Jason Whitlock is Jason Whitlock. You know, I came along and shared something that I agreed with him on maybe a month or two ago, but I told you then that I'm one of those people that uh, I don't dis, uh, miss the message because of the messenger. Uh, I'm, I don't have to like you to agree with you if you're saying something that's truthful. The truth is what I seek. Uh, it's not the approbation of others. It's not to be in alignment with others. It is the truth. And something he said I agreed with. Uh, I think it was something that was uh, he was taking a stand against something Stephen A. Jackson's, uh, Stephen A. Uh, Smith said, and I agreed with it. But I told you then that you know uh, that would be, wouldn't be long before he was saying something that I disagreed with. And here we are again. You got to be careful because most people are gonna sit them. So well, well, he's telling the truth. But the thing is, under what context? The bottom line is, if she's wrong, she's wrong. We don't need to talk about what he did because the jury has found out despite what he did, he did not deserve to die. That's the only thing that needs to be on the table right now. That's the only thing we need to be talking about. Do we need to maybe uh, do a better job of training our children, our, our, our young, young men and young women, how to respond uh, when they're stopped by police officers? Yeah, I think we need to do a better job of preparing them. I think we need to do a better job of um, ensuring that they know what it is they need to do and how they need to respond and what not to do to put themselves in a situation that won't turn out well. But at uh, any cause, someone resisting is not a, a, a reason to take their lives. And the idea that just simply resisting is putting yourself in harm's way is a problem. Cops are supposed to be trained to deal with people who resist. Not everybody is just going to sit down and say, arrest me. And the idea that them resisting is an automatic license to kill is unacceptable. And I think that that's something that we need to be very vocal about. And we have to be careful not to let these people who tend to act like they speak for us, uh, let that be the narrative. That is not the narrative. That young brother did not deserve to die, no matter what he had did. This isn't about condoning anything that he did wrong. It's about saying despite whatever he may have did, it did not warrant his death. And if it did not warrant his death and he died, there's a problem. And that's what we need to be focused on is that problem. If we need to deal with some issues internally on about how to, how to interact with uh, law enforcement, then we deal with that. But we don't put that on front street while they are handling a case on our behalf. We don't do that. But Jason Whitlock is Jason Whitlock. So you're only going to get so much from someone who has different interests. See, you got to understand, most people in positions like that are concerned with their interests. And their interests will very rarely align with the interests of the masses because they are getting their pockets lined by the elite. And so you have to understand that. Now, with that being said, 
Lawrence Smithfields. Lawrence Smithfields is a young 23-year-old black, uh, I want to say girl, um, because I've got daughters way older than her, but a, a young lady, a black young lady, 23 years old, who was found, uh, depending on what report you read, unresponsive and later died or dead in her apartment. Uh, the death was reported initially by an older white man who she met on Bumble, which is, when I understand, a dating app. Um, and the parents have not had a lot of success in getting uh, any type of information or response from the police department. They were so unsatisfied with the response and the interaction with the police department that they paid for, a, out of their own pocket, an autopsy. Uh, to be conducted on their daughter to ensure that they got uh, the truth. And they're waiting on those results. But in the meantime, they had to bury their daughter this week. Uh, 23 years old, young, black baby. And I know there's some people out there don't like me to call uh, women, women of adult age babies. Like I said, I've got a daughter 36, so I think a little different. Um, while I expect them to act like ladies, they're young, and they're impressionable. They don't know it all. They don't have the experience uh, that we have, and so we can't expect them to make the decisions that we would make. Uh, you have to look back at some of them dumbass decisions you made when you were 23, and you made them. And so we have to understand they need covering. And that's all I mean when I call them a baby is someone who needs a covering. Uh, and I think our women need coverings regardless. But that's another, that's another uh, topic of discussion on another day. Well, here's the problem. And the reason I'm actually bringing this story up on the same uh, video as what we just discussed about Jason Whitlock. Uh, the moment that the information got out about this young girl and the fact that she had met an older white man on a dating app, the entire response, uh, it, I won't say the entire response, but a large portion of the response started being about the dumb decision of hooking up with a white man and the assumption that she was expecting him to be uh a sugar daddy and uh, a bunch of other things and what again we have to focus on at what point does any of that regardless of whether you agree with it or not no I don't agree with the white man thing period I definitely don't agree with her moving towards an older white man where there's probably not a whole lot in common and um, limits the parameters and uh, rules of engagement of the relationship when that's not a whole lot in common to share we get the idea of what type of relationship the older guy's expecting and we can make assumptions about what she's expecting out of the deal but at no point in time does that warrant her death and I think we have to stop uh, victim blaming which is what happened with um, Jason Whitlock and Dante uh, Wright is what if, if what had she did what had she what had she done that warranted her death under what circumstances should she have been murdered and obviously we're talking about a 23 year old um her parents insist that she has no history of drug use uh, from what can be gathered by what I've been able to uncover, uh, there's no indication of any history of drug use. So you take drugs out of the equation, and there are some other things that can happen. It could be something as simple as an aneurysm. Um, aneurysm, it could be something along that line. And, um, that could be a health condition, an undetected health condition that could lead to instantaneous uh, death or uh, incapacitation and so in that you have to sit up and you have to say okay maybe it's that but the chances of a 23 year old otherwise healthy former track athlete dropping dead at 23 
not likely. You're normally going to be looking at some form of foul play. And so again, my problem is how easily we throw hours away because they don't fall in line with what we think should be. Uh, behavior unbecoming, I guess, is a way of putting it. My thing is, no, absolutely don't agree with the whole white guy thing. Uh, second of all, I don't agree with the older guy thing. I think that that's putting herself in harm's way. But <laughs> it happens. Um, while I don't agree with it, while I won't co-sign it, um, and I've I've had enough uh, books, articles, lectures, videos on my position on that topic um, to for for everybody to understand. I'm not out judging anybody. I don't mishandle or mistreat anybody because they're choice and mates. Um, I have friends who have made those choices, and we are close. Matter of fact, some of my friends are very, we're very close, but they understand that's my position in general and in whole. I'm not gonna tell you who to be with, but I'm gonna tell you I think that uh, a pattern like that is not good for us. And I'm not a person that believes you can't control who you fall in love with. Yeah, you can. Um, and no, you don't get to choose who you fall, yeah, yeah, you do. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to break off and tell you how you do. When people tell me you don't control who you fall in love with, it, it, it amazes me because it's really instinctive and not well thought out. Look, if you can sit up and say, I don't want a drug addict, I don't want uh, a, a, corrected, a, a convicted criminal, I don't want a user, I don't want a cheater, you can choose all these parameters on which you're going to use to qualify your mate. I don't want anybody overweight. I don't want anybody uh, that's an alcoholic. I mean, all these different parameters, and you can do it at a very intense level. In other words, I'm not going to choose anybody in that. You can also say I'm not going to be in a relationship with someone who is not of my ethnicity. I've done it. And I've been exposed to a whole lot of people who don't look like me. And uh, at the time that it was happening, uh, I was probably very appealing to them because of what I represented for them. And I mean, none, I mean, not even in the slightest. I'm not just talking about not having a relationship, I'm talking about no romantic sexual interaction, period. I chose that. That was purposely chosen. That was a part of the parameters. Doesn't mean I've always chose good mates. No, haven't. But that was one of my parameters, and it wasn't going to be violated. So you can choose who you fall in love with. You can set parameters. Now, if you allow people into your space, see, the thing is, I never allowed anybody that didn't look like me to get into a space where they could get my attention on that level. Same way that the average woman... Uh, who is out there is not going to let uh, a four-time convicted felon into a space that will allow them to get close to him and file for him. Uh, and all the other reasons why you won't date someone, male or female, you can, you can make that a part of the rumor. So the idea that you can't choose who you fall in love with is simply a, a not well thought out excuse to do what you want to do. My thing is, if you want to do it, do it and live with it because it's your life. But don't sit up and say that. But back to this, this young girl. The responses that I've seen on social media, you know, it immediately goes to, that's what you get for going for a sugar daddy. These are actual responses. That's what you get for going for a sugar daddy. That's what you get for uh, going out there mess with them old white man. That's what, no, none of that should mean you end up dead. Was it a wise choice, in my opinion? Uh, no. But does that need to be a part of the discussion of why she's in this situation? She's in this situation because somebody took her life, and nobody has the right to take her life, regardless of who they are and whatever she did, unless she was trying to take theirs. Now, with all that being said, I think we really have to stop doing that. It's amazing how we throw hours away so easily. 
because they don't fit into uh, or in, al in alignment with what we think should be, uh, what we hold to be true in our own minds, our own ethical standards, our own values, interests, and principles. I think we've got to do a much better job than we're doing in that. Uh, because if I treated people like that, all the people I help would probably not be getting my help. Um, people are where they at in their journey. What you can do is contribute to their knowledge, contribute to their understanding, contribute to their growth, uh, contribute to their healing, uh, but judging them based on where they're at because in your mindset they're not where you're at. It's not how you create unity. It's not how you create growth. It's not how you create collective power. It is immensely important that we get an understanding of this. It's so easy to become judgmental. It's so easy to do that. But we've got to get beyond that. We've got to get beyond the idea that everybody's going to be where we're at. Like, like uh, Brother Malcolm said, you weren't always where you are now. And you should always remember that. On that note, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Like I, like I say all the time, know that we need your support. If you believe in the work we're doing, click the link in the uh, description box and give or give to us directly through the organization's uh, cash app handle. Uh, regardless, either way, uh, thank you guys for listening to me on Christmas Eve. You guys have an unbelievable day, and I am going to be done and out of here.